Welcome to Whiskey Cast, Cask Strength Conversation, featuring news and interviews from the world of whiskey. I'm Mark Gillespie. This is episode number 867 for April 19th, 2021. Coming up in a few minutes. You know, these varieties are bred differently enough that you're bound to see differences in flavor. And nobody had really looked at this before. The assumption was that, you know, rye is rye, wheat is wheat. It doesn't make any difference once you are taking it apart in the distilling process. But then you find that, no, there's some, there's some definitely some unique flavors here. And you kind of shake your head and wonder why we assumed that. This is the time of year when most farmers are getting out into the fields to plant their spring crops. Mike Swanson plants his rye in the fall, though. This year's crop has already sprouted on his family's farm in Minnesota, up near the Canadian border. Mike and his wife Sherry Reese run Far North Spirits and turn that grain into whiskey. But for the last few years, they've also been using their field as a laboratory. It turns out rye isn't as generic as we might think, and some strains of rye perform better in whiskey than others do findings of their study have just been released, and I'll talk with Mike later on WhiskeyCast in depth. We'll also have the What I'm Tasting This Week department, your voice, behind the label, and... I'm being told I may have to get into costume this year as well, Mark, so that's a terrifying thought, hey? The news is next on this week's WhiskeyCast. And now, a message from Robin Redbreast. Hiya, Mark. How's my favourite red breast fan doing? Look, I'm going to address the elephant in the room right away. We both know your podcast is dying for a co-host. And I know just the lad who can be the Robin to your Batman. How's that for dropping a hint? Proud sponsor of WhiskeyCast. Redbreast. Pass it on. After 175 years in business, Dewar's could rest on its laurels. But we've always believed in staying curious, which brings us to Portuguese Smooth, the brainchild of our award-winning master blender, Stephanie McLeod. Portuguese Smooth is a high-quality blended scotch finished in real ruby port barrels for a taste like no other. Let's get started with the news. As of today, there are just 43 days left before the European Union and Great Britain are scheduled to double their tariffs on bourbon and other American whiskeys. The current 25% tariff was imposed in June of 2018 after the Trump administration imposed punitive tariffs on European steel and aluminum imports. The move was intended to protect the U.S. steel industry on national security grounds. While it did do that, the side effect has been a severe impact on exports of American whiskies to Europe and the UK, down by more than a third to Europe and more than half to the UK since the tariffs took effect. That has cost U.S. whiskey makers millions of dollars in lost export sales. 47 drinks industry groups in the Toasts Not Tariffs Coalition are urging all three sides to work out a solution and end the tariffs. During the group's online webinar the other day, Congressional Bourbon Caucus co-chair John Yarmuth of Kentucky said he's talked directly with President Joe Biden and other White House officials about the problem. This is not something that's kind of an abstract threat or maybe kind of a just like, uh, well, this is our chief area of growth potential in the bourbon industry because We've been starting to make inroads in foreign markets. That's our real growth opportunity. But in fact, the distilleries have acted on this. They've made huge investments, uh, putting up uh, hundreds of thousands of barrels of bourbon, uh, building expanded warehousing facilities and so forth. So this is something that uh, I think is, is we continue to have to stress, and that is distilleries have bet on being able to sell their product uh, in, in the European Union and elsewhere overseas and to put money where the mouth is, and have uh, grown an industry predicated on being able to rely on tariff-free trade among the, uh, among the countries of the world. The caucus has asked U.S. Trade Representative Catherine Tai to separate the spirits tariffs from the steel issue 
in her ongoing talks with European leaders. The caucus's Republican co-chair is Representative Andy Barr of Kentucky. Early last year, I was in a meeting on trade policy with Ambassador Lighthizer. Uh, when it was my turn to ask a question, he preempted the question. And he said, every time I see you, I know I'm going to get an earful about bourbon tariffs. Our work is obviously not finished. Uh, the fact that we do have a pause with the UK on the aircraft dispute um, maybe gives us a little opportunity to, to get past this and extricate the, the, the bourbon issue from the other trade disputes, the unrelated trade disputes. Our policy should be fair and reciprocal trade. And when we are giving complete access, unfettered access to our markets in terms of distilled spirits from the UK, when our exports still are, are facing this steep tariff and we don't have access to the UK in an unfettered basis, that is not fair and that is not reciprocal. So we need to work on that. I'm going to continue with the same persistence and focus that I had with Ambassador Lighthizer, with Ambassador Tai. And uh, this issue isn't about partisan politics. It's about promoting free and fair trade and ensuring that America's native spirit is not made a pawn in a long-running, unrelated trade dispute. Now, there could be a potential thawing in that frosty trade relationship between the U.S. and the European Union. EU Trade Commissioner Valdis Dombrovskis has now proposed to suspend the European tariffs on American whiskeys and other products for up to six months, if the U.S. will do the same for its tariffs on European steel and aluminum. That would give the two sides time to work out a long-term agreement, which would also have to include Great Britain as a negotiating partner, since it still has the same tariffs in place from when the U.K. was part of the European Union pre-Brexit. The U.S. has not publicly responded to the EU's offer, but we do know U.S. Trade Representative Catherine Tai has been discussing global steel oversupplies with her European counterparts over the last couple of weeks. Both sides have blamed China for flooding the market with government-subsidized steel and aluminum that makes it hard for Western steel producers to compete. As I mentioned before, the Trump administration imposed those tariffs on imported steel and aluminum three years ago on national security grounds to protect the American steel industry. And this weekend, the Washington Post reported that Biden administration officials are hinting that they may keep the tariffs in place. Commerce Secretary Gina Raimondo has said the tariffs helped save American jobs, and the administration is depending on political support from the United Steelworkers Union. Union President Tom Conway told the Post that the tariffs are, quote, a ham-fisted approach to the problem, but that they can't be lifted until a long-term solution to the steel issue is found. Meanwhile, there is another issue facing whiskey makers worldwide that also needs a long-term solution, but it may not come until after the COVID-19 pandemic is over. That's because the pandemic has strained another industry that is critical to those of us who love whiskey, even though it's in the background for most of us. The pandemic has strained the global logistics and shipping industry well past its breaking point, as we saw during the recent blockage of the Suez Canal by a crippled container ship that torpedoed shipping traffic worldwide. Ports on both the east and west coasts of the U.S. have had problems getting cargo ships unloaded because of dock workers that have been affected by COVID-19, and there's a global shortage of empty containers for transporting not only whiskeys between countries, but the stuff whiskey makers need to get their whiskeys to market. It's not just grain, but things like used bourbon barrels being shipped from Kentucky to distilleries around the world, and empty bottles from glass factories also around the world. Kentucky's Castle and Key Distillery had its Resurrection Rye whiskey all ready to go earlier this spring, but co-founder Wes Murray told reporters during a recent Zoom tasting that they needed one final thing, the custom-made bottles that were stuck in Europe. The supply chain aspect of, of everything right now has been really challenging getting things into the country. 
So, you know, you know, we've got stuff coming from Europe, we've got stuff coming from Mexico and um, it's, you know, it's just not reliable. Um, I got stuff coming from South America and um, you know, we're, we're, you know, we're air, we air freighted in glass uh, to, uh, from, uh, from France uh, for our rye whiskey release, which, you know, you know, buying, buying a plane ticket for, for, for glass bottles is not a cheap way to, uh, to get your, you know, to make, to make money, but it was really important to us to, to release. On top of that, the U S also has a nationwide shortage of truck drivers to haul containers to their final destinations once they've been unloaded from the ship. In Scotland, workers at Chivas Brothers are being asked to vote on whether to go on strike next month after contract talks broke down between the company and their unions. GMB Scotland and Unite are both criticizing Pernod Ricard for freezing pay in Scotland while its workers in France received 1% raises earlier this year. Chivas Brothers employs around 1,600 workers across Scotland. The Press and Journal reports balloting will end on May 10th, and strikes could begin a few days later. Chivas Brothers CEO Jean-Christophe Coutures said the company's most recent offer included guaranteed pay raises in 2021 and 2022, and noted that the company maintained 100% of its jobs and salaries during the COVID-19 pandemic, even as Scotch whiskey exports fell worldwide. New whiskeys unveiled this week. Ardbeg has revealed this year's limited Ardbeg Day bottling. The Ardbeg Committee version of Scorch will be available starting May 1st, with the standard bottling to come out as usual in early June around Ardbeg Day. That's traditionally the final day of the Isla Festival of Maltant Music, which has been canceled for the second straight year because of the pandemic. Ardbeg's David Blackmore told me more about the heavily charged single malt. The fun marketing story here, you know, is that uh, our flavor-breathing dragon in warehouse number three has heavily charred our casks, you know. If you know Ardbeg, you know that we take the process of making good whiskey very seriously. But when it comes to everything else, you know, whiskey should be fun. And we hope that we you know, make it fun with the stories we tell. There's always a, a little grain of truth in everything, you know. So apparently there are stories, you know, going back as far as anyone can remember and beyond on Isle of, you know, dragons and knights and all the rest of it. So there's a, there's a grain of truth in there, I guess, somewhere. Hey? I hear that. Uh no Ardbeg Day at the distillery this year, obviously, ah, but uh, yeah. you got a virtual one again this time, right? We do. And there's, um, I've had my first meetings about that. I'm going to keep a lot of that you know, under wraps for now. But um, think along the lines of the, of the Scorch packaging and all the rest of it and the story behind Scorch that we're coming up with. There'll be some hilarity for sure. And um, I think I may have to get into, I'm being told I may have to get into costume this year as well, Mark. So that's a terrifying thought, hey? Oh boy. <laughs> Shorty costume, dragon costume, or knight's armor? Which one? <laughs> I'm not quite sure yet, but you're somewhere along the, the, right, the right lines. Hopefully not a shorty costume. That would be a bit weird. <laughs> the virtual version of Ardbeg Day will take place online June 5th. Meanwhile, Bladnock is out with its newest release. Vinaya is a no-age statement single malt that's matured in ex-bourbon and sherry casks. The name comes from the Sanskrit word for respect and gratitude. It'll be available in 45 countries, including the UK, the US, and Australia. In the US, it should carry a recommended retail price of around $70 a bottle. Master of Malt has teamed up with Glenfiddich to release a new limited edition tasting collection set. It includes the new Grand Couronne 26-year-old single malt, along with the Grand Cru 23-year-old and three other Glenfiddich malts. The set of five 30-milliliter samples also includes access to online tastings with Glenfiddich's Struin Grant Ralph this month. They're available for around 60 pounds each. Buffalo Trace will be releasing its second annual batch of kosher whiskeys in the coming weeks. There are three whiskeys in the series, 
the kosher rye recipe bourbon, the kosher wheat recipe bourbon, and the kosher straight rye. The eight-year-old whiskeys were produced under the supervision of the Chicago Rabbinical Council. They'll sell for around $40 a bottle. Finally, Buffalo Trace is working with the University of Kentucky on a new 15-year-long research project to study the genetics of white oak trees. Volunteers planted more than 1,000 seedlings last week on the farm at the distillery. The seedlings came from nine different U.S. states, and researchers will be studying how those trees respond to different irrigation and forestry practices. More seedlings will be planted over the next two years, and the trees could eventually be used for Buffalo Trace barrels in a few decades. You can keep up on the latest whiskey news all week long at whiskeycast.com. Join us this Friday night for the Happy Hour Live webcast. This week I'll be joined by William Grant and Sons Maltmaster Brian Kinsman, who oversees not only Glenfiddich, but Tullamore Dew in Ireland, Gibsons in Canada, and other whiskies. We'll start at 5 p.m. New York time, 2100 GMT, on the WhiskeyCast YouTube channel, our Facebook page, Twitter, and Twitch. You can also catch the on-demand replay of last Friday night's webcast with Four Roses master distiller Brent Elliott on our YouTube channel. Time now for the Whiskey Cast Calendar of Events. It's brought to you by Catoctin Creek Distilling. Tickets are still available for Bourbon's Bistro's 16th anniversary dinner. It's coming up this Wednesday night. And their Derby Handicapping Dinner next Tuesday. Teeling Whiskey Company in Dublin has a virtual master class on the 28th. And the Flatiron Room in New York City has its first in-person Whiskey 101 class in a year on the 29th. The OurWhiskey.com Virtual Whiskey Festival and the Spirit of Speyside's Virtual Festival also get underway on the 29th. While the Spirit of Toronto's Discover series of virtual tastings gets underway on the 30th. McTeers has its next whiskey auction in Glasgow, Scotland, May 7th. The Whiskey Show Sydney is on May 14th and 15th in a new venue. The hotel that was originally hosting the event near Sydney Airport is apparently now being used as a COVID-19 quarantine site for travelers returning to Australia. And finally, Whiskey Live Canberra is still on the schedule for May 28th and 29th in Australia's capital city. Remember, all in-person events are still subject to change on short notice, depending on local public health restrictions. So do make sure you check with event organizers before you make any travel plans. We do update the calendar at whiskeycast.com throughout the week, as we get updates on event changes and details on new events. The calendar of events is brought to you by Catoctin Creek Distilling, makers of the Virginia Rye Whiskey. You'll find their Roundstone Rye at fine whiskey shops in 26 U.S. states, three continents, and online. Visit the Where to Buy page at CatoctinCreekDistilling.com to find a retailer near you. And please drink responsibly. After 175 years in business, Dewar's could rest on its laurels. But we've always believed in staying curious and pushing boundaries. Which brings us to Portuguese Smooth, the brainchild of our award-winning master blender, Stephanie McLeod. Port Smooth is a quality blend of eight-year-old scotch finished in real ruby port barrels for a rich, complex spirit with notes of red cherries, creamy vanilla, and honeydew melon. It's like no other scotch on the market, and you can find it right now at a store near you. Whiskey Cast in Depth is brought to you by the Distiller's Edition Collection. Single malt whiskey makers have talked about the varieties of barley they use for a long time now. You may have heard over the years of Golden Promise, Concerto, Oxbridge, and other strains of barley, and a malt distiller would never think of just ordering up some generic barley from the maltsters. 
Rye very rarely gets that level of respect, though. The farmers who grow it know what strains work best in their fields, but once they deliver their grain to the buyers, it generally goes into the commodity system as just plain generic rye. The thing is, though, there are just as many varieties of rye as there are of barley, and not all of them make good whiskey. Mike Swanson is a fourth-generation Minnesota farmer and first-generation distiller. He and his wife Sherry Reese own Far North Spirits in Halleck, Minnesota, just a few miles south of the Canadian border. And for the last six years, they've been working with the University of Minnesota and the State Department of Agriculture to study the influence of rye varieties on the flavor of whiskey. They planted 15 different varieties of rye along with their baseline Hazlitt rye over a three-year period, then distilled each of the grains into new-make spirit for blind tastings. The results of that study have just been published, and Mike Swanson joined me on a Zoom call with the findings. We've talked about this rye study in abstract before because it was obviously still in the field pun intended. Sure. But uh, now that it's complete, what did you find? So basically, in a nutshell, what we found was uh, we saw differences between the white distillate that were significant based on just variety alone. So all other things being equal with the milling, the mashing, the fermenting, and the distilling, everything else was the same, but the variety of the grain itself changed the flavor. And so we were able to document that. And that was a significant finding because to my knowledge, it really just, when rye, it just really hadn't been looked at before. And um, it's being examined now. There's, I think, a couple other studies out there that are looking at various things. Um, but I wanted to establish variety before I started looking at anything else. But we did, what I think though is, it's not part of the study itself because statistically, we just looked at the white distillate. But we barreled those white distillates too. And my hypothesis was with that was going to be that the barrel is going to pretty much roll over any differences in flavor that we found in the white. Um, but then we cracked some barrels open and that hypothesis was completely wrong um, because the, I don't know how this happened, but the barrel amplified those differences in flavor. And uh, to such a degree that we cracked open a barrel that, that had a variety called Oakland in it. It's an older uh, Oklahoma variety of rye. And we cracked that barrel open and we were just like, who the hell put scotch in this barrel? You know, it, it actually was reminiscent of a Highland single malt. And we were like, how in the world did this happen? And, <laughs> but it was really interesting. And we found that the most unique flavors uh, came from the older varieties, the newer uh, German hybrid varieties of rye performed fantastically in the field. And they were good to work with uh, in the process. They had good flavor, don't get me wrong, but they kind of resembled each other. In between the new hybrids, there wasn't a lot of difference in flavor. The flavor was good. It just was pretty uniform across those hybrids. Um, whereas the open pollinated varieties had all this difference between them. And unfortunately, some of the older varieties tasted fantastic. And I really didn't want to grow them again because <laughs> they, they were a pain in the field. Um, but I couldn't deny the uniqueness of the flavor coming out of the barrel. It was pretty fascinating. A lot of folks just think rye is rye. Mm -hmm. Just like uh, we think corn is corn. Right. And barley, we know better because we've heard for the years in Scotland about things like Golden Promise yep, and all these strains of barley that uh, distillers have been switching around and using for years to improve their whiskeys in Scotland. But rye really isn't just plain rye, is it? It really has the complexity that uh, every other grain has. Yeah, it really does. And that was eye-opening because, you know, in our agricultural system, not just here in the U.S., but, you know, globally, you know, there are things that are bought and sold as commodities. And wheat and corn and soybeans and rye are 
you know, they're bought and sold as commodities. And so the assumption is, is that as long as it meets a certain standard of quality, that there's really no practical differences in between varieties. And that's just a concern of farmers who are, you know, using specific varieties because of their soil type and climate and things like that. Well, when you start looking into it, though, you start finding that, you know, these varieties are bred differently enough that you're bound to see differences in flavor. And nobody had really looked at this before. The assumption was that, you know, rye is rye, wheat is wheat. It doesn't make any difference once you are taking it apart in the distilling process. But then you find that, no, there's some, there's some definitely some unique flavors here. And you kind of shake your head and wonder why we assumed that, you know, because if you look at grapes, you know, if a sommelier told you that, you know, well, this Sauve Blanc was grown in New Zealand and this Pinot Grigio was grown in Italy. And the difference between New Zealand and, and Italy is the difference between them, you know, and they, and they just told you, well, it's just white grapes instead of telling you it's Sauvignon Blanc or Pinot Grigio, you know, if they just said, well, it's made from white grapes, um, you'd think the Somalia didn't really know much. And so we look at that with, with grain and we're finding that, yeah, this is, it's a similar situation. Um, the differences are maybe a little more subtle, but we don't know that for sure either. I mean, uh, there's a lot more research to be done here and I think we can find, um, you know, we can find some pretty fascinating flavors by just looking at variety alone. Let's get the T word out of the way right now, because uh, <laughs> I knew that was coming. <laughs> yeah, because you know, we're, we got to talk about terroir because it's been the rage these days. But you grew all these grains in the same field, right? Yeah, I mean, uh, some of my test plots were on the other side of the road, you know. But we're talking about you know within twenty feet of each other. I mean, this is this is very similar ground, and so I think the next step now is to, if you really did want to look at the T word, that I think the next step is to take these varieties and grow them in different places. And not just, you know, 10 miles apart, but we're talking about different parts of the country. And then process and distill them in the same facility and see if you see differences between place where we saw differences just based on variety. I think that would be fascinating. You know, it's it's not a research study without a, a call for more research. So you got to um, we want to take a look at that next. But I think jumping to the T word before you've established differences in variety, I think, is a, you're, you're jumping the shark there or whatever the phrase is. Um, but we've been asked about that. And th- I think we've we've been asked questions from people who are, I think, confusing variety with Tawar. And variety has a very specific definition, whereas Tawar is a lot more nebulous, as you know. Um, So we talk about provenance a lot, but my feeling is with Tawar is that, you know, it's kind of, I'll let the winemakers have Tawar for sure. Um, But, you know, I use a commercial yeast strain. I don't use wild yeast. Um, I'm distilling. So I'm manipulating that, uh, that product. And so I just don't feel like compared to a biodynamic wine that's been grown in a specific place using wild yeast and no other intervention, I really don't feel like I can use that word. Is there a correlation between ease of growing in the field and ease of distilling? Mm, Somewhat. There were the varieties that did extremely well in the field and they did process uh, easier uh, in our in our distilling process, and so that raised the question: Okay, why? Why were they easier? And I'm working with a consultant now, and we're going to take a look at the grain components, um, just to see everything from you know protein, starch, beta glucans, all all the different chemical compounds that are in that grist. Um, and take a look at, well, is there something we can point to that is the, the ease factor, or is there something else we can point to that's the difficulty factor? Because some of the older varieties were a real bear in the cooker, and they didn't do very well in the fermentations. They, you know, were, they were just more difficult all the way through the process, but they had these unique flavors. <laughs> And so it's like, it's one of those things where you're just kind of like, you know, 
oh man, I wish we could have the best of both worlds here, but maybe if we take a look at that, you know, we're analyzing the grist, maybe we can find some answers. So it's the, the study itself has, has come up with, you know, just as many questions as we started with. Um, it, we just didn't know to ask them at the beginning. And that's what any good scientific study should do is give you more questions for the next round of funding and research. Exactly. Exactly. So how do you implement this now? It's a good question. <laughs> I'm still what, are you, what, what are you going to plant this year? Because you're in planting season well, so coming up soon here, I've right? Already, this, year is, this year has already been planted. Last fall, I planted 100 acres of hazlet, and I planted 10 acres of musketeer. And what my plan is going forward is to grow you know, a little more acreage than a test plot so that I can lay down multiple barrels um, rather than just one. Um, Because some of the varieties yielded so poorly in the field that we only got enough grain for one batch out of an entire acre of rye. I mean, some of them were pretty lousy. They didn't like it here, (laughs) you know, and this is a harsh climate. And so, you know, if you're going to grow well here, you got to be really tough. And some of them just didn't do well. So then we, we only could run a single batch. And so with some of them that had some really interesting flavor, I'd like to grow more acreage and commit, you know, more acreage to them so I can lay down some large format barrels as well. Because we aged everything in 15 gallon barrels for 18 months, just for expediency. But it'd be interesting to see what some of these varieties do in a 53 gallon barrel aged for four to five years and see how they develop and what else shows up um, with that time in the barrel. I'm also going to take a look at some heirloom varieties. Um, I was discouraged from that by our small grain specialist because he said, look, you know, a lot of varieties have been heirloomed for a reason. (laughs) And he said uh, they usually were problematic for some reason, whether it was disease resistance or lodging or something like that. Um, But there's been some intriguing developments in a particular variety that originated in Scandinavia and was kind of rediscovered in a drying sauna. Um, And it's uh, one of the names for it is Midsummer. It has some Swedish names as well. I might be able to get my hands on some seed. Um, It's a small amount. I'm going to be basically building my own seed vault here, but I think it's an interesting one to play with in addition to evaluating the new ones as they come down the pipe. Because there's new rye varieties coming out of Germany just about every year. And some of them are, are pretty impressive. So it's a little bit of both. With the, uh, and you mentioned these new varieties coming out of Germany. How much research is being done into rye hybrids and new styles of rye compared to uh, barley and corn and uh, other crops that get more attention? Well, in the U.S., it's very little. And that's why the new varieties are mostly coming out of Germany. Um, North Dakota State University in Fargo released a variety called Dillon back in 2016. And that one was pretty impressive. Um, it was a good solid variety. Um, it did well in the field. It tasted good coming off the still. It tasted good coming out of the barrel. Um, it was a good performer, but there's not a lot of new varieties coming out of the U S. Um, there's some coming from Canada and in the U S rye just doesn't get the funding for the most part, the funding in the U S goes to corn, soybeans and wheat. But in Germany though, um, they're coming out with new varieties every year and the yields are phenomenal. Um, the research is solid and they obviously know what they're doing over there because the, the varieties are impressive. Um, but I'll be, I'll be looking at, uh, everything I can. The, the plan is to grow, uh, one or two varieties every year instead of, nine or six or whatever, but grow them in, in larger uh, amounts so that I can lay down more barrels. And then that will be our subsequent seed vault release every year will be one to two varieties um, that I've looked at that year. What does this say about our commodity system for handling grain in the agricultural industry? Well, it's, it's really efficient. (laughs) Um, it's a very efficient way of getting a commodity to the hands of, of the people who turn it into a finished product, whether that's bread or, or what have you. Um, but what we've found is that the information that the farmers have can be extremely valuable. Um, they, you know, 
with variety and what they know about soil type and, and growing conditions and things like that, what we've found is that that information has been historically has been lost early in the process. But I think what it says, at least for distilling, is that the farmer really has a voice here when it comes to the quality of the whiskey. And if you leave that voice out, you're really missing a big component of what makes a great whiskey great. Um, and so I think it's, there's going to be a lot more attention paid to this. Part of that commodity system, and we've talked about this on the show before with uh, Dr. Steve Jones at Washington State University, is that the commodity system tends to uh, emphasize yield over flavor. Mm -hmm. Are you finding that with rye as well? Yeah. I mean, the yield, um, like, for example, in the German hybrids, um, we saw yields of 150 bushels per acre, which is unbelievable for rye. <laughs> like Hazlitt averages 50 to 60. Um, Oakland, we got 20. Um, and then with Bono, Brissetto, Frissetti, Cassani, all these new varieties from Germany, we were seeing yields well over 100 bushel per acre. But as I mentioned, they had a good flavor, but they all resembled each other. And that's kind of to be expected when you think about the differences between an open pollinated variety and a hybrid. A hybrid is the result of very specific plant breeding um, that isolates a specific parent and develops into um, a progeny that displays very, very similar characteristics. Unfortunately, you can't save seed from a hybrid. It won't display the same trait in the next generation. Open pollinated varieties pollinate over a longer period of time. And so you have a little more variability in the field, um, plant height and different characteristics like that. The field of an open pollinated variety won't be as uniform. But what we're finding is, is that that lack of uniformity can also be the key to unique flavors. Now, when I say unique, I don't always mean good because <laughs> some of them were not great um, as white distillates nor coming out of the barrel. And so there's a little bit of a gamble there. You got to do your research. Um, the hybrids are more uniform in the field. They're more uniform in flavor. There's more um, homogeneity in the, in the process all, all the way through. But what you don't find with the hybrids are those are those really unique flavors that can stand out. Of the uh, different varieties that you made this whiskey from, do you have a personal favorite? You know, we still really like Hazlitt. Um, I was relieved that Hazlitt did as well as it did, both as a white distillate and as um, a finished whiskey. It really does have a unique flavor profile, which I was glad to, to really establish. But there were a couple others. And what you're getting here, Mark, is you ask a Gemini what their favorite is, you're going to get three answers at least. Oh, of course. But Oakland was interesting enough that it, it just stood out as so unique. Um, the other one that surprised me was Spooner. And that was an older variety out of uh, Wisconsin. And it had just a wonderful flavor profile coming out of the barrel. It did not score well as a white distillate. And it didn't process well, and it didn't grow very well. <laughs> but it it was it was Sherry's favorite um, coming out of the barrel, and so that one will have to make its way into the rotation. So, yeah. Let's give some credit to the folks you worked with on the research. Uh, you worked, I know, with University of Minnesota, right? Yeah, specifically uh, Dr. Yoakum Wiersma, uh, who's a small grain specialist at the U of M. Um, absolutely instrumental to this whole thing happening and just his information and network and, and connections have been absolutely invaluable. Um, and just his knowledge and statistical knowledge and acumen and having a, you know, a, a full fledged professional academic work with your, on your research is uh, there's just no substitute for it. Um, so that was primarily the, you know, the, the biggest factor, of course, the Minnesota Department of Ag, um, which 
they provided the grant. So without that, the research doesn't happen. So the Department of Ag is also absolutely, absolutely critical here. Um, so those are the really the, the two biggest things um, to give credit where credit's due. Um, but yeah, it was, it, was, uh, it was a real process, but it was a lot of fun too. We have posted a link to the study and its findings in the show notes for this episode at whiskeycast.com. And don't worry, it's easy for the layperson. For instance, the rating Swanson and his team gave each rye variety for their distillability is also referred to as a swear factor. On a scale from 1 to 5, a 4 or 5 rating means one could cook that rye in front of their grandmother, while a 1, well, it should only be cooked in the company of sailors and or distillers only. That's Whiskey Cast in Depth. It's brought to you by the Distillers Edition Collection lineup of single malts from Diageo's Classic Malts. Look for the new editions of Oban, Talisker, Lagavulin, Craigenmore, Dalwini, and Glen Kinchy at a whiskey shop near you. And get all the details at malts.com. The one I'm tasting this week department is brought to you by Sagamore Spirit. I've had some samples from Far North's Seed Vault series on my tasting table for a while now, waiting for the results of this study just to get a sense for the differences myself. On that swear factor scale, Wheeler Rye got a 1. And while it's not possible to taste it with a 7 second delay, let's take a look at it anyway. It's bottled at 47% ABV, and the nose has a nice combination of nuttiness and sweetness, almost like honey-roasted peanuts, along with dried flowers, orange marmalade, and a hint of vanilla. The taste is well-rounded with gentle spices, orange marmalade, a touch of honey, roasted cashews, and dark chocolate. The finish is long and gentle, with a good balance. And I'm scoring this one a 90. Mike Swanson mentioned the Dillon Rye, created at North Dakota State University. Once again, this one's bottled at 47% ABV, and Dillon gets a 3 on the swear factor scale, meaning it behaves much better than the Wheeler Rye. The nose is very floral and green, with tart berries, pine needles, subtle spices, and a touch of butterscotch ice cream topping. The taste is well-balanced with subtle spices, dark chocolate, raspberries, and a hint of wintergreen that comes alive leading into the finish. That minty character lasts and lasts on the finish. It's complemented by subtle hints of raspberries, dried flowers, and a touch of pine. The Dillon Rye is better behaved in the distillery and in the glass. I'm scoring this one a 92. The Prima Rye also scored a 3 on the swear factor scale, but there's a completely different character to this whiskey as well. As with the others, it's bottled at 47% ABV, and the nose here is earthy and nutty with touches of garden soil, fresh flowers, almonds, and peach cobbler. The taste starts out soft and sweet, followed by a slow buildup of baking spices, along with a slight nuttiness, dried fruits, peach cobbler, and a slightly floral character in the background. The finish, long and slightly dry, and I'm scoring the Prima Rye a 91. I'll have more tasting notes in just a minute, but first... This week's tasting notes are brought to you by Sagamore Spirit, the award-winning rye whiskey distillery based in Baltimore, Maryland. Try their signature cask and double oak rye whiskeys, each a proprietary blend of high and low rye mash bills. Sagamore Spirit has mastered the transformational art of blending. Learn more at sagamorespirit.com. Please drink responsibly. Turning now to American single malts, the Virginia Distillery Company has released the third batch in its Courage and Conviction range. 
The first two batches honored the distillery's late founder, Dr. George Moore, and the distillery's original consultant, the late Dr. Jim Swan. But this batch honors the very much alive consulting blender, Nancy Fraley, with not just one bottling, but three, breaking down the component casks Nancy uses to create each batch. Of course, there is a bourbon cask version, and all three are bottled at 46% ABV. But for our purposes, I'm going to compare the same distillate in the other two types of wood. The sherry cask version is a blend of Oloroso, Pedro Jimenez, and Fino sherry casks. The nose has notes of toffee, figs, cherry pie, dried fruits, and raisin bread. The taste, fruity and tart, with figs, plums, and dates, along with brown sugar, cherry pie, and a hint of raisins. The finish is long and fruity. I'm scoring the Courage and Conviction Sherry Cask a 92. The Cuvée Cask, though, uses Dr. Jim Swan's trademark European Oak STR Casks, shaved, toasted, and recharred red wine barrels. Here, the nose has notes of raspberry jam, cherry cobbler, baking chocolate, and subtle spices. The taste has a nice balance of baking spices, raspberry jam, cherry cobbler, and brown sugar, while the finish is long and well-balanced with lingering spices and fruitiness. I'm scoring the Virginia Distillery Company's Courage and Conviction Cuvée Cask a 92. I'll be adding my notes for the Bourbon Cask Edition soon at WhiskeyCast.com. And, of course, that's where you'll find my tasting notes for more than 3,100 different whiskeys from all over the world. The What I'm Tasting This Week department is brought to you by Sagamore Spirit. And now, a message from Robin Redbreast. Small batch. How would you describe it? It's like... An Irishman's understanding of baseball. Extremely limited. Proud sponsor of WhiskeyCast. Redbreast. Pass it on. Let's open up the inbox now for your voice. The other day, I received one of those emails journalists always get around this time of year from a PR person trying to pitch me on interviewing their client, a so-called, quote, preeminent expert on whiskey, to talk about whiskeys for, quote, pops for Father's Day. Oh, there was so much to complain about here. One, I'd never heard of this self-styled whiskey expert, who seems to have about 160,000 followers on Instagram. And even though I've been podcasting and writing about whiskeys for almost 16 years, I would never claim to be an expert on whiskey. But that's not what really bothered me. It was the focus on Father's Day and whiskey. Why not Mother's Day? I looked back at the last ten episodes of Whiskey Cast leading up to this week. At least five of them featured interviews with women who not only drink whiskey, but make it or write about it. I shared an edited version of that email on social media, with names removed to protect the innocent, and, by the way, I should tell you the publicist who sent it is a woman. The responses, as you might guess, were a bit heated. Donna, at Zappa Fay on Twitter, is a longtime listener, and she responded with this. As a woman who enjoys whiskeys, isn't married, or has kids, I buy my own. Part of the enjoyment is exploring and trying new whiskeys. By ourselves, tasting with friends and family, or visiting where they are made. An expert would know women enjoy whiskeys, too. Laura Hay added this from Scotland on Facebook. Things like this really grind my gears, lol. I've been either around or working in the industry my whole life, and I still will never call myself an expert. Well said, Mark. Our pal Maggie Kimbrell, the executive director of Berman Women and a fellow writer, added this. 
I called someone on sending me a Father's Day pitch in March, and her response was that she felt it was too late to send a Mother's Day pitch. By the way, that's the same excuse the publicist gave me in this case, too. And as for that preeminent whiskey expert line, Lana Sutton in Tampa responded with this. Jeez, I hope it's not anyone I know. Remember, gang, mothers drink whiskey, too. And as at Myth Placed on Twitter says, the best mothers. If there's something you'd like to share with whiskey lovers around the world, you can always get in touch with us on Twitter, Facebook, or Instagram at WhiskeyCast. The email address, comments at WhiskeyCast.com. Let's close out the show now with Behind the Label, our look at the history, science, and all those other things that make whiskey unique. It's brought to you by Writer's Tears. This week's Whiskey Photo of the Week came from my trip to Highland Park Distillery on Orkney a couple of years ago and features the floor maltings at Highland Park. That led to some questions about how many distilleries in Scotland still have their own floor maltings in use. Back in the day, just about every malt whiskey distillery in Scotland malted its own barley on site, but efficiency and cost-cutting over the years gradually led to the widespread use of commercial maltsters and the closings of almost all floor maltings. At last count, there are seven still active, in alphabetical order now, Balvenny, Benriach, Beaumore, Highland Park, Lafroig, Kilhoman, and Springbank. And it is worth pointing out that most of those distilleries still depend on commercial maltsters for most of their barley and just do a percentage of it on site. For instance, Highland Park uses commercially malted barley for all of its unpeated grain and uses the peat from a nearby bog on Orkney to dry the grain it malts on site. If you have something you'd like us to look at on an upcoming episode, just use the contact form at whiskeycast.com to get in touch with us. Behind the Label is brought to you by Writer's Tears. Writer's Tears Copper Pot, a rare style of Irish whiskey with a creative twist, a unique triple distilled blend of single pot still and single malt premium Irish whiskies. Writer's Tears Copper Pot. Do you dare to be creative? That's all for this edition of Whiskey Cast. You'll find links for the stories in this episode in our show notes at whiskeycast.com. That's also where you'll find the latest whiskey news, my tasting notes, the calendar of events, the whiskey photo of the week, and of course, a complete archive of past episodes going all the way back to 2005. We'd love to hear from you. You can always get in touch with us on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook at WhiskeyCast. The email address, comments at WhiskeyCast.com. This episode of WhiskeyCast is finished. You know, like Dewar's Portuguese Smooth is finished in ruby port barrels. All right, so that wasn't the smoothest segue, but it is remarkably smooth to drink. Curious? Try it. You'll see. And now, a message from Robin Redbreast. Ever go out drinking with a peacock? <laughs> Always the same. Few too many, tail feathers come out, drinks get knocked over, bartender's not happy, night's over before it started. All I'm saying is, don't be the peacock in your group. Proud sponsor of Whiskey Cast, Redbreast. Pass it on. Whiskey Cast is a production of Cask Strength Media. Copyright 2021, and comes to you from the charming, yet regrettably dry town of Haddonfield, New Jersey. I'm Mark Gillespie, reminding you that when you drink, please drink responsibly. Thanks for listening, and please stay safe.